if there's one thing that'll get me to actually make a video these days, it's finding something stupid. And I did. His name's Dave. David Noel. He works, or <laughs> claims to work, at the Ben Franklin Center for Theoretical Research. There's no such thing. The only place it's mentioned on the internet is his own website, aoi.com.au. It does um, not look very official, more like an old GeoCities-style 90s-era personal website. Remember those? And it's full of stupid. In fact, I may very well come back for more. Uh, but today I'll be looking at his claim that the cosmic microwave background is not what we've been told. For the record, what we've been told, that is, what is the current best understanding based on the available evidence, is that the CMB is sort of an afterglow of the Big Bang. But to be a little more technical, the Big Bang theory predicts that about 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was in a hot, dense state where the laws of physics as we currently understand them break down. For the first 400,000 years or so after the expansion began, the universe was still so hot and dense that while it can be described by known physics, it was full of dense plasma, which is opaque to electromagnetic radiation. Light couldn't get anywhere. After those 400,000 years had passed, the temperature was low enough that the plasma turned to gas. It's called recombination. And gas is transparent. The first light emitted that actually got anywhere? There you go. That's the CMB. When we look out far enough, we see a figurative wall called the surface of last scattering. Light from beyond that wall was emitted before the universe became transparent, so it never got anywhere. We can never see electromagnetic radiation from beyond that point. Due to space having expanded, the wavelength of the CMB has been redshifted, that is, drawn out into the microwave band, hence cosmic microwave background radiation. Translating microwaves to visible light, the surface of last scattering looks like this. I trust it looks familiar. In the early days of the Big Bang Theory, the absence of the CMB, predicted by the theory, was an argument used against it. But in the 1960s it was found by accident, and matched the predictions with remarkable accuracy. This became the nail in the coffin for non-Big Bang cosmologies, none of which predict that the CMB should exist. Now let's get to the stupid, shall we? Quote, Following the original discovery of CMBR, several satellites were placed in space specifically to detect and measure the radiation. These include COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer, and others. The shape of the CMBR spectrum was defined with good accuracy. All the data showed that the radiation peak was consistent with thermal radiation from very cold matter, at about 2.7 Kelvin, less than 3 degrees above absolute zero. Yeah, so far so good. Uh, I should add that the CMB doesn't just look like thermal radiation, it looks like thermal radiation emitted by an almost perfect black body. A black body is a body that absorbs all incoming radiation and doesn't reflect anything. Perfect black bodies don't appear to exist in nature, they're idealizations, but the CMB spectrum is the closest thing to a perfect black body spectrum we have found. That's going to be important later. Quote, with the discovery of CMBR and its identification as emitted from matter at around 2.7 Kelvin, it might be thought that astronomers would strive to identify all possible sources for its origin. In the event, due to what might now be regarded as an unfortunate coincidence, this research was never done. And we're off. While the CMBR has a spectrum consistent with emission from cold matter, it has not been identified as being emitted from matter at around 2.7 Kelvin. The plasma that filled the early universe, when the universe first became transparent to EM radiation, was thousands of Kelvin. As the radiation moves through expanding space, it gets redshifted. Its wavelength increases, meaning it corresponds to blackbody radiation emitted from something cooler. Currently 2.7 Kelvin. As for the research never being done, no, actually it was done. 
Plenty of people attempted to find alternative explanations, going as far as looking into the possibility that the CMB was just instrument error caused by the presence of literal pigeon shit. The problem is that no other explanations have held up. They're out there, but they're widely regarded as failed fringe science, if not outright pseudoscience, because they just don't hold up. Quote, in modern times, however, many defects have been found in the ideas that galactic redshifts imply that the universe is expanding, that this started with a Big Bang, and that the CMBR originated from this explosion. Let us go on now to look at a much more realistic source for the CMBR. Many. I was not aware that zero qualified as many, but um, okay, fine, show me something better. And uh, by the way, the Big Bang was not an explosion. Space expanded. In an explosion, energy is given off to the surrounding environment. The energy is still inside the universe, so no, the universe did not explode. Space did not explode. Space expanded. Quote, current theories in this area mostly work from the inside out. They assume a star is formed by the aggregation of interstellar gas and dust, and around this star a protoplanetary disk of loose matter is formed, from which planets condense. Larger objects still in the system, but well beyond any planets, are assumed to have got there by being thrown out from the inner planetary area. In Cosmic Smog, the opposite approach was taken. Interstellar space was assumed to consist throughout of a soup of objects, not only gas and dust, but also planetesimals, asteroids, planets, and objects the mass of Jupiter and higher. In this model, a star is formed when an aggregation of matter from this soup reached a mass great enough for stellar ignition to occur, with its hydrogen being converted to helium and heavier atoms, as in our Sun. Oh, so the protoplanetary disk thing is bullshit. And uh, this is not an assumption, it's a conclusion based on evidence. Pseudoscience proponents almost always claim that anything science says is an assumption, when in actuality it is almost always a conclusion based on evidence. And if it is an assumption, it is justified because it leads to a theory that demonstrably works. Calling things assumptions that are actually conclusions or implying that it's just something people have pulled out of their ass when it's actually perfectly justified, that's either deliberately dishonest or an indication of pretty severe ignorance. Quote, the model turned out to give better explanations of known facts about our own solar system. For example, why some meteorites appear to be of greater age than the sun. The oldest material ever found on Earth is 7.5 billion years old. As the Sun was forming, the odd pre-existing piece of crap making its way through interstellar space would fall into the protoplanetary disk. They get captured, accrete matter in the cloud, and after billions of years we find that a few such objects have crashed on Earth. If you were right, Dave, we'd expect to see things like this all the time. Hell, we'd even expect the planets to be older than the Sun, and this simply isn't what we observe. Quote, to give some idea of scale, in our solar system the outermost planet is Neptune, which orbits at about 30 AU from the Sun. 1 AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Beyond Neptune, at about 30 to 50 AU, there are some dwarf planets with highly inclined orbits. Beyond about 100 AU, which can be taken as the limit of the Sun's gravitational influence, lies the Oort cloud. Yeah, that checks out, but for the record, the Oort cloud is a huge swarm of small bodies hypothesized to surround the solar system. It's believed to be where comets originate. See, comets are made mostly of ice, so when they swing by the sun, they melt. That means they can't last very long, astronomically speaking. Presumably, comets reside in the Oort cloud, and every now and then the odd comet has its orbit perturbed because of collisions or gravitational interaction with a passing object, and it shoots off toward the sun. I say the Oort cloud is hypothesized to surround the solar system because, although it is a very good hypothesis given that comets exist and it 
can't realistically be wrong, or at least not completely wrong. The simple fact of the matter is that we can't observe it. Comets are too small and too faint to be observed at that distance, given our current technology. So, while it is a very good hypothesis and is generally accepted to be most likely correct, it does remain a hypothesis. Quote, so the general picture in the cosmic smog model is of a galaxy-wide Oort soup containing gas, dust, planetesimals, planets, and black dwarf stars of subsolar mass, in which there are occasional volumes where a mass aggregation great enough to form a working star has occurred. This star then hollows out its surrounding volume of the soup, slowly rationalizing the orbits of planets and other objects within its gravitational reach to lie closer to its own equatorial plane. Um, see, the problem with this is that while interstellar space is populated by gas, dust, the occasional planet or planetesimal, or rogue planet, I should say, the simple fact is that the density of space, or the stuff in space, is higher near a star, because stars are massive bodies that tend to attract stuff. You know. Gravity! Quote, a major unexpected outcome of the model concerns dark matter. Uh-oh. Quote, if the Oort soup existing in this sphere had an average density of only one-tenth that of our solar system, it would have a mass a hundred million times that of our sun and planets. This is more than ample enough to explain dark matter phenomena. No, it absolutely wouldn't. A soup of conventional matter would interact electromagnetically. See these gas clouds, for example? Yeah, notice anything funny about them? That's right, they're visible, because they interact with light that passes through them. The idea that dark matter is conventional matter has been explored, and it simply doesn't work. In order to account for the gravitational effects of dark matter, this matter would have to be visible to us, and it isn't. Quote, the origin of the cosmic microwave background radiation thus becomes virtually self-evident. Most of the matter in the galaxy consists of cold bodies very distant from stars or other sources of light. CMBR is produced by normal thermal radiation from matter as cold as 2.7 Kelvin. The source of CMBR is the Oort soup, making up most of the universe. Wow. Okay, so... 1. The suggested soup would not emit a near-perfect blackbody spectrum, because it's not made of near-perfect blackbodies. 2. The CMB is almost perfectly uniform. The distribution of the Oort soup would not be. 3. Black bodies absorb light. As such, they can't be transparent. This means that if you did have a uniform distribution of matter in the Oort cloud, and this was the source of the CMB, it would have to be totally opaque. So we would not be able to see any stars other than the Sun. The Oort cloud would be the edge of the observable universe. See these stars? Yeah, there goes your hypothesis. Quote, My view is that it's always better to listen to Occam, to apply Occam's razor to an intellectual framework you have before you. William of Occam's tenet was to say, in brief, if you have to decide between a number of explanations of a matter, you should always choose the simplest. Incorrect. You should choose the simplest one that fits the facts. Entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Simple in this context does not mean intuitive or easy to understand. You can have a very convoluted, very complicated theory that is very difficult to understand, takes years to study it and, and learn anything about it, like general relativity, for example. But if it can explain 10 different things, as opposed to having 10 separate, very easy to understand theories explain one of those things each, the former alternative is preferable according to Occam's razor, because you're using one theory to explain a lot. Quote, in the current case, the Oort soup approach replaces the cumbersome and shaky Big Bang theory, not with another theory, but with standard physics. No theory needed. No. For one, the Oort soup 
theory doesn't fit the facts. And second, the Big Bang theory not only does, but it does so without being cumbersome or shaky, because it's a single theory that accounts for all known facts regarding the large-scale evolution of the universe. It explains why the universe is not yet in a state of heat death, and why stars have not yet consumed all hydrogen. The universe is not infinitely old. It explains why more distant galaxies recede from us faster than nearby ones. The universe is expanding. It explains why there is more helium than could have been produced in stars, given the amount of time since all matter was in the same place. In the early universe, it was so dense that hydrogen fusion could occur anywhere. It explains the uniform distribution of matter at large scales. There's no center of space itself from which it expanded, so there's no preferred location or direction. The universe is homogeneous and isotropic at sufficiently large scales. It explains why the observable universe isn't infinite. Light has only had time to travel so far. And of course, as I already mentioned, it explains the CMB. No extra theory needed. What this means is that even if the Oort soup model did fit the facts, which it doesn't, you'd still need more theories to explain all those other things that the Big Bang model explains. Finally, no theory needed? What the hell is standard physics if not an explanatory model that makes testable predictions? You know, a theory. Theory does not mean thing I disagree with, it means explanatory model. The Oort soup is supposed to be a theory, it's supposed to explain things. Facts are the empirically verifiable data points. The theory explains and predicts the facts. How is that so hard to understand? Why is it that no one who opines on why science is wrong even knows what a theory is? Before you start talking about why science is wrong, you should at least learn what it actually says. This is so frustrating that the people who are the most certain that what science says is wrong are the ones who don't even know what science says. Go to school. <sighs> okay, that was stupid. But at least it was original. See ya.